hear something about the spiritual background of your childhood. Did you have a devout Jewish upbringing? I was the oldest of four boys. Uh, my father, who had come to Britain as a refugee from Poland at the age of six, had to leave school at the age of 14, so he never had an education, not Jewish or secular. My mother had to leave school at the age of 16. Mm. So my parents didn't know that much. What they did have was a great love for Judaism. And, you know, I, I tend to think that's probably the ga greatest gift you can give a child. Mm. Wordsworth said it beautifully. What we love, others will love, and we will show them how. Mm. Mm. Are we, are we soft but wonderful? Mm. Uh, all right. And then, so, uh, did you surprise yourself? Did you surprise your family by becoming a rabbi yourself? Um, it was a surprise to all of us, yes. I had absolutely no intention of becoming a rabbi. I went to university to study economics and then philosophy. Uh, but uh, in my first year, um, the Six-Day War happened. Now, we don't know, in retro we can't understand in retrospect quite how tense that was, the build-up to it mm -hmm. was. In the three or so weeks before, in that June of 1967, it did look as if Israel was surrounded and was about, God forbid, to suffer some horrendous defeat. As, and we, born after the Holocaust, felt, I think all Jews around the world felt, there was a real possibility, God forbid, of a second Holocaust. And then, of course, the war happened with astonishing speed. Uh, and there was a sense of exhilaration. But, you know, I had been really shaken up by this. And I sort of began very slowly and over the years to delve more and more deeply into the question of what it was to be a Jew. Mm -hmm. And eventually, years later, really many years later, I began to study for the rabbinate, not intending to be a rabbi, but just to get deeper to the roots of this faith and this 4,000-year-old tradition. Mm -hmm. And that eventually led you to, this, to the vocation. Yeah. I. Um, I did also uh, meet some quite great rabbis, sadly no longer alive. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, uh, who was the great thinker of right, American right. Jewry. Uh, but in particular, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, who was one of the great, great leaders of modern times. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who actually told me to become a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And um, I respected him as a man of global vision. And so I did it. And I wonder if, when you became chief rabbi in 1991, if uh, it would have surprised you. So there you were, the last years of the 20th century. If it would have surprised you that at this point, 10 years into the 21st century, or even just a few years into the 21st yeah. century, religion had risen so utterly to the surface of global life. No, actually. <laughs> um, in 1990, the BBC asked me to give a very famous series of lectures called the Wreath Lectures. They're given once a year, there's six lectures on radio, first given by Bertrand Russell in 1948. I was only the second religious leader to give them. And I call them the persistence of faith. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably the first response to Francis Fukuyama's vision of the end of history. You know, right. the Berlin Wall had fallen, Soviet Union had collapsed, end of Cold War. Everyone was seeing uh, what he foresaw as the you know, seamless spread of liberal democracy over the world. And I said, no, actually, uh, I think you're going to see faith return, and return in a way that will cause some problems, because the most powerful faith in the modern world will be the faith most powerfully opposed to the modern world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we call that series of lectures the persistence of faith, um, which was a way of saying, you think faith is gone. You have no real idea how forcefully it's going to come back. So that was in 1990, the year before I became chief rabbi. And nothing that's happened since has surprised me, though it has saddened me. Mm -hmm. Religion is a great power, and anything that powerful can be a force for good or, God forbid, for evil. But it's certainly fraught and dangerous, 
and needs great wisdom and um, you know great if I can use this word gentleness mm -hmm. I also think you're very articulate about the positive reasons that that faith persists and in fact that religious traditions uh, have a new vitality both for good and and for ill um, you know you you talk about how and I think that, the, that uh, this is all intensified by the complexity of the 21st century. Economic systems create problems that cannot be resolved by economics alone. Yeah. Um, politics creates problems that cannot be resolved by politics alone. And globalization brings that to a whole new level. Well, you know, there's this very strong feeling that you get that God never sets us problems that can't be solved. Hmm. Um, you know, you, I, you know, t we are, you know, each year we tell the story of Abraham and that call from God to leave his home, his the land, his father's house, and travel to a land which I will show you. I call that, you know, the journey into insecurity. Mm. And it's been pretty insecure for Jews for 4,000 years. We're still on that journey. And bad things happen, very unexpected things happen. I'm always struck. A lot of people are struck by the history of Jewish suffering. I am struck by the history of Jewish recovery from suffering. What gives a people to, the strength to keep on going? And it is that feeling that you can face the future without fear if you know you are not alone. It's that famous line in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That, I think, is the positive reason for faith in the 21st century. We can handle anything so long as we have the humility to know that we are answerable to something much greater than ourselves. And so I'd like to draw you out um, some more on how Jewish experience and Jewish tradition you know, what resources and vocabulary uh, that might bring to, to this now, to this global moment, which is not merely uncertain, <laughs> but certainly marked by change, which is stressful for human beings. One of the ways you've talked about that, not uncontroversially, is about mm. the approach you see deep within Jewish tradition to difference. Yeah. It seems to me that... Um, one of the things we most fear is the stranger. And at most times in human history, most people have lived among people who are mostly pretty much the same as mm -hmm. themselves. Today, certainly in Europe and perhaps even in America, walk down the average main street and you will encounter in 10 minutes more anthropological diversity than a, an 18th century traveler would have encountered in a lifetime. So you really have this huge problem of diversity. And you then go back and read the Bible and something hits you, which is we're very familiar with the two great commands of love. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. But the one command reiterated more than any other in the Mosaic box 36 times, said the rabbis, is love the stranger. For you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Or, to put it in a contemporary way, love the stranger because to him, you're a stranger. Mm -hmm. And this sense that we are enlarged by the people who are different from us, we are not threatened by them, that needs cultivating, can be cultivated, and would lead us to see the 21st century as full of blessing, not full of fear. One thing that I'm struck by in conversations I have with scientists, with mm. neuroscientists, with mm. clinical psychologists, f first of all is how <coughs> science is studying virtues that, that their traditions have mm. kept alive, virtues of compassion and mm. altruism and mm. empathy and forgiveness. Mm. And one of the things that science is now able to demonstrate mm. biologically mm. is that it is when we are able to see the other mm. 
to see the welfare of the other as mm. somehow linked to our own, mm. um, that, that we're able to rise to these, to these moral ideals. And mm. in that context, um, you know, when I, I, I think that these teachings mm. that have been, that are ancient, that have been cultivated, mm. Mm. Uh, the source of conversation across mm. generations, mm. Uh, brought forward in time of, of how to honor the stranger, to mm. love the stranger, mm. um, that, there, that there's no more critical virtue. Mm. And, and I wonder, mm, you know, and, and, and again, it's, it's, it's not a, an easy thing to talk about. Mm. Um, but do you have an experience of of uh, in, in your conversations and in your work and presence as mm. chief rabbi these years of, mm. of a new conversation starting where you can in fact offer these virtues to the 21st century in a new way. You find people receptive to this and... Oh sure, mm -hmm. I mean you take, um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm really not very good at sort of operating machines or computers or things, you know those clever things that we need our grandchildren to tell us how they work. Mm. And so, uh, you know, having tried to make a machine work for three hours totally without success, um, I fall back on that old aphorism, when all else fails, read the instructions. Right. <laughs> okay. So, you know, when all else fails, science has finally shown us, to the distress of some scientists, that religion might have got it right all along. And here we are reading those instructions afresh through the eyes of quantitative and experimental science and discovering what the great traditions of wisdom were saying three or four thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. We now know um, that it is um, doing good to others, a network of strong and supportive relationships and a sense that one's what life is worthwhile are the three greatest determinants of happiness. And not at all what the culture out there is telling us, you know, how much we earn, how much we own, what we buy, where we go for holidays. And you know, somehow or other, against our will sometimes, we are being thrust back to these ancient and very noble and beautiful truths. And that we can now do so in a fellowship awkward perhaps and embarrassed between religious leaders and scientists and social scientists. Mm -hmm. And different kinds of religious leaders, right, across traditions as well. Totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing that really, for me, changed the world, my life, uh, as I said in one of my books, called The Dignity of Difference, it was standing at ground zero. You know, a couple of months afterwards in January, well, it was January 2002, together with the Archbishop of Canterbury and religious leaders throughout the world. And we were looking at this wreckage, the sheer harm that hate can do. And yet at the same time, he here we all, all were from many of the world's, if not most of the world's faiths, uh, in, in friendship, fellowship, <coughs> and shared prayer. And I just saw how clearly that is. Those are the terms of the equation. Are we, do we go that way or do we go this? And since then, I have really made the effort, I think we all have, of going out, not just to Christians, I'd had a good relationship and a strong one with them, but with Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Zoroastrian, Baha'i, the whole range of the world's religious expressions. And in each one, you find that they have an enormous gift, many perhaps, to give the whole human project. So I'd like to talk about the ideas that you brought forward in the dignity of difference and mm -hmm. I think have continued to develop ever yeah. since. Um, you know, I remember a very, very intelligent, excellent American com journalist mm. commentator after September 11th, 2001, who made a statement that what those events demonstrated was that in order for the three monotheistic religions in particular to survive and be constructive members of society in the 21st century, they would have to relinquish their exclusive truth claims. Um, and I think that sounded like it made a lot of sense to many people. The case you make in the dignity of difference is also aimed towards the traditions uh, being constructive uh, parts of the 21st century, mm. but, but you take that in a different direction. So let, let's talk about how it is possible in your 
imagination, to retain uh, the essence, the, the truth claims of Judaism, and, and also, as you say, honor the dignity of, dif of difference, understand oneself to be enlarged rather than threatened by religious others. I use metaphors. You know, each one may be helpful to some and not to others. Um, one way is just to think, for instance, of uh, of the of the of biodiversity. The extraordinary thing we now know, th thanks to um, Crick and Watson's discovery of DNA and the decoding of the human and other genomes, is that all life, everything, you know, I, all the three million species of, of life and uh, plant life all have the same source. We all come from a single source. Everything that lives has its genetic code written in the same alphabet. Unity creates diversity. Hmm. So don't think of one God, one truth, one way. Think of one God creating this extraordinary number of ways, the 6,800 languages that are actually spoken. Don't think there's only one language within which we can speak to God. That's one way. Another way, for instance, is to try and get people to break away from the logic of zero-sum games. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have $1,000 and I decide to share it with nine other people, I only have a tenth of what I began with. If I have total power and decide to share it with nine other people, I only have a tenth as much as I began with, the more I share, the less I have. But when it comes to love, it doesn't work that way. Or trust, or friendship, or even knowledge. The more I share, the more I have. You see, one of the things that led the monotheisms into some quite difficult territory is to say, there's a zero sumness, you know. If I want all of God's love, then he really can't be loving anyone else. I don't think the logic of scarcity applies to God. I don't even th think it applies to a human parent. What kind of parent would it be who could only love one of their children? And yet, yes. Okay. I left my cell phone in my room. I was a good girl. So, so you know, one one thing I've. Um, actually just recently discussed with an mm. evangelical Christian leader mm. on my show, is um, the fact that the, the word that has come forward in American political life that came forward after the 1960s when we <coughs> began to have genuine pluralism was this notion of tolerance, which mm. I don't think goes nearly far enough for mm. religious people. Mm. Um, I know in Britain a word that has become problematic is this notion of multiculturalism. Mm. Um, I mean, you really raise the stakes in what mm. we're talking about here, with echoing what you've just said to me. You know, you've, you've asked in The Dignity of Difference, can we hear the voice of God in a language, a sensibility, a culture not our own? Can we see the presence of God in the face of a stranger? Yeah, well, here, let's, let's uh, not try to describe this as 21st century radical theology. It always helps if we can locate it in sacred texts. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, here is a moment where um, the hero of the book of Exodus is a young man called Moses. And the villain of the book of Exodus is somebody called Pharaoh. But it's Pharaoh's daughter who, at great risk to herself, saves the life mm -hmm. of this young baby who she knows immediately is a Hebrew baby. That's, she says so. And she knows her father has decreed that every male Hebrew child should be killed. So at great risk to herself, she takes this child into her home and brings it up. So there we have the daughter, the biggest villain of the book, 
who is responsible for the saving of the life of the hero. Now, if that doesn't challenge our paradigms, I don't know what does. You can find God in the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something the Bible is doing quite a lot. After all, you know, there's only one perfect individual, well, perhaps two, if you like, in the whole Bible, and neither of them is Jewish. One is called Noah, and one is called Job. Hmm. And neither is Jewish. Noah comes before Judaism. Job is what I call every man. Um, so, you know, and, uh, and then you look at all the prophets of ancient Israel, and they spent lifetime preaching to the Israelites, and nobody listened. Now, God says one, sends one prophet, Jonah, to non-Jews, the people in Nineveh, the capital of Israel's traditional enemy, the Assyrians. He only does is say five Hebrew words, one English sentence, in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, and they all repent. So it turns out that non-Jews are better at listening to Jewish prophets than Jews are. Right, so there is this so, paradox, you know, this, this very interesting... Uh, recurring thread of, of otherness. Yeah, the, and Bible, the Bible is saying uh -huh. to us the whole time, don't think that God is as simple as you are. Mm -hmm. this, the, he, he's in places you would never expect him to be. And you know we lose a bit of that in English translation. Because when Moses uh, at the burning bush says to God, who are you? God says to him three words, ehye, ashe, ehye. And those words are mistranslated in English as I am that which I am. Mm -hmm. But in Hebrew it means I will be who or how or where I will be. Meaning, don't think you can predict me. I am a God who is going to surprise you. And one of the ways God surprises us is by letting a Jew or a Christian discuss discover the trace of God's presence in a Buddhist monk or a Sikh tradition of hospitality or the graciousness of Hindu life. You know, don't think we can confine God into our categories. God is bigger than religion. And at the same time, and I think you would say it as an and rather than a but, there is also a special relationship that is, that is evident in those texts, and a covenant that is particular to the Jewish people. And, and, and even as you honor the dignity of difference, you, you are upholding the dignity of that particularity. So talk to me about how, how theologically, how you bring those things together, how they're not a contradiction. By being what only I can be, I give humanity what only I can it is my uniqueness that allows me to contribute something unique to the universal heritage of humankind. And I sum it up, the Jewish imperative, very simply, and it has been like this since the days of Abraham, to be true to your faith and a blessing to others regardless of their faith. And so, you know, I, I, I thought about Heschel when I was reading you also, and I, you, you didn't, I, well, at least maybe, I know you do mention Heschel in, 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 in all that I looked at. You didn't in particular talk about his, uh, his idea of depth theology and mystery as uh, something that, in fact, at the depths even of, of orthodoxy um, is something that religious people have in common. Because there is a bit yes, of mystery there, there to that, right? In what you're saying, mystery. there's... There's something there beyond what our categories uh, can comprehend. And it is in that margin of mystery uh, that we have to place the relationship of the other with God. I understand my relationship to my late parents, but I can't ever really understand my brother's relationship. Each relationship was so private. And our relationship with God is private. But it doesn't mean to say it doesn't have relationship with other people, other languages, other traditions. And we will never understand that. 
And yes, I, 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 I didn't particularly study Heschel. I did meet him as a young man. Mm. I mentioned I met two rabbis. I also met him at the same time. Um, I, I just kind of discovered after I'd written Dignity of Difference, somebody said to me, well, go, go and read Heschel, and I could see there was a, a real kinship there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, I, I think that I know that, there, that what you're saying has been difficult for some of your fellow, fellow Jews in Britain, that, that, this, that the dignity of difference was controversial. What is the point of being a religious leader if you don't say <laughs> don't something that's difficult for right. the people who follow you? You know, you've got to challenge them mm -hmm. and be challenged by them. You know, you have to listen when they say, uh, Chief Rao, you're going too far or too fast for us to follow. And then you say, okay, we'll slow it down, but I want you to come with me. I will not allow myself to be a lone voice within Judaism. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we slowed it down a little but my rabbis today are all actively engaged in reaching out beyond the Jewish community, in, ma in cultivating good relationships I, across Is that Britain. new? Has that, has that uh, deepened, expanded in this last decade? Is totally. there much more of that? It, it became a real, I mean, it became and you mean an imperative for me. mean Orthodox rabbis of, of yeah. Great Britain? It, uh, it became an imperative for me after 9-11, but it became an imperative for us after 7-7, our own mm -hmm. uh, terrorist incident in 2005. In the subways and in the transportation subways. system. And there was a real fear uh, that the backlash against you know, the Muslim community in Britain would be terrible. And actually, there wasn't a backlash because we had put in, at the top, some real effort across the faiths. And there was a feeling in Britain I think people sense this, that we work very closely together. Uh, but once that had happened, we realized that we had to take this down to street level and really get the local communities to work on it. Uh, and so we've worked at it, and uh, uh, together with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the head of the Catholic Church, Cardinal uh, Archbishop Vincent Nichols, we do this with the other faiths. Uh, and we lead from the front on this. You know, th there, there's an irony in the fact that your, um, your theology has been so em embraced and welcomed by other religious leaders and more controversial in your own tradition. And yet, I think that's a very common irony of the 21st century, alongside all of these other things we're saying. There's a sense in which, on some levels, interfaith encounter is easier yeah, of course. That, you know, that a lot of, I'm speaking for the United States, a lot of the most bitter divisions yeah. are within denominations, sure. right? Not just, you know, within Christianity writ large, but within the Presbyterian Church, within uh, the Southern Baptist Church. There are, and there are Jewish corollaries to that. Uh, what, you do know, you, what do you think the, about that? What's that the, phenomenon? How does that go together? That with goes it? because all the most intense arguments are in the family. <laughs> right. You know that, and you know why it is, because uh, if you have an argument with a stranger, the stranger can walk, um, and therefore they never really get to that level of intensity if you don't want the stranger to walk. Uh, but within the family, you can have the worst possible row with your brother or sister, and tomorrow and the day after, they'll still be your brother and sister. So you can have a really bad row without really threatening the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume that the human propensity to have arguments always fills the available space, so you have more space for it with those close to you. And yes, within the Jewish community, those arguments between Orthodox conservative, right, reform, right. and secular Jews have an unusual intensity. So here is the way we resolve these arguments eventually in, in Anglo jury. And I think they will probably work, well, they certainly work, would work for Jews anywhere in the world if people were minded to. And what I say is this, on all matters that affect us as Jews, regardless of our religious differences, 
we will work together regardless of our religious differences. On all matters that touch on our religious differences, we will agree to differ, but with respect. So we will work together on interfaith, fighting anti-Semitism, on Israel, on welfare, Holocaust Memorial, and so on. We work together across the denominations, and there are certain things on which we recognize that we cannot work together. But it is those areas where we do work together that allow us to build up a real personal friendship. Um, and so I think what we've created in British Jewry is, is pretty workable. And it takes all the esteem and the passion out of things. That took years to get right. Mm -hmm. But eventually it does work. I mean, you've compared the beginning of the 21st century um, to the beginning of the 17th century in yeah. Europe in terms of religion. But I also think this is one of these remarkable moments where I mean, it's not it's not just religious yeah. change. It's change, so, right? Yeah. It's a, it, we are redefining science, institutions, yeah. the definition of what yeah. it means to be human. Um, so a lot of the most difficult rifts uh, within U.S. religious traditions mm. have to do with moral issues. Yeah. And um, I like to. T I think you've said some really. In you've written some very interesting things about that that I, I, I just like to dig into. So you've said that um, the 20th century saw the collapse of moral language. Yeah. So in fact, e even as we are forced to take up these very difficult, intimate mm. conversations, I think that's an interesting observation. We don't have as rich and complex a vocabulary as we need. So say some more about that. What what happened to that moral language and? Well, you know, there were all these attempts to find a scientific basis for morality. Uh, and they gave rise to all sorts of theories, like um, Kant's idea that it's moral if you are willing to prescribe for everyone what you prescribe for yourself. Or Bentham had this utilitarian approach, what's right is what brings about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And there were a lot of these quasi-scientific or mm -hmm. logical systems, and none of them worked, or rather they all worked for some cases, not for others, and it turned out to be a lot more complicated than people thought, and people were arriving at real intractable moral disagreements. They finally said, well, in that case, there can't really be any moral truth out there or any single moral truth. So really, um, when I say this is good or this is right, I'm really just saying I like it. And that is when we move to moral relativism. Now, moral relativism um, seems to be the most tolerant form of morality. You do what you want to do, and I will do what I want to do. However, it actually leads to enormous intolerance, because if there is no objective standard of morality, how am I going to show I'm right? And when that happens, it is the loudest, angriest, mm. rudest voice that wins. Yeah. And if you have noticed among atheists, for instance, some very angry, rude voices. Yes, stridency is at both ends of that Absolutely, and they are the ones who accuse religion of being intolerant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, moral relativism is really bad. And today you'll find morality under the bookshelves, inspirational, self-help, you know. How do I meet my personal life goals and so on? And all of a sudden, morality has been all about me. Mm -hmm. There's something superficial about yeah. a lot of it. I mean, you, there's this great phrase. Actually, this was someone else quoting you yeah. that you'd spoken of the devastation of our rainforests of moral language. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also observe that the liberal democracies of the West yeah. have adopted mechanisms that marginalize moral considerations. Yeah. That's an interesting statement, too. What, yeah. what, tell me what you see there. Well, a government nowadays in a liberal democracy will generally refuse to take a moral stand. So government then becomes a matter of management, really. It's a branch of management, rather than enacting a vision that we share of the kind of world we want to create for our grandchildren. So, you know, politics becomes... Uh, Certainly in Europe, it's become very morally neutral. And when a politician in Europe, like Tony Blair used to do this and get criticized for it a great deal every time a, 
a politician makes a, a moral speech, you know, they used to call him an evangelist. He's right. giving us a sermon, you know, which is a big insult in, in Britain, which is quite a secular culture. So politicians find it very, very difficult to make a moral statement. And if you dare to say that certain forms of family are better than other forms of family, then that's it. You're in exile for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. But, oh, that gets into difficult territory about governments deciding what is moral and good. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not critical. Mm -hmm. I think you have these three great sectors in the modern world. One is called the state, one is called the market, and the state and the market should not be making moral choices. But then they need to be counterbalanced by this third sector that we call the civil sector, the sector where we live as families, as communities, as friends, as members of a religious congregation, where we really do form relationships with people that are driven by clearly moral principles, by sense of duty, responsibility, integrity, fairness, being there for others. Now, those areas, if those areas are strong, then a politician will not do something that's immoral, and a business person will want not just what's best for him, but best for his employees, best for his customers, best for the community in which his business is set. Um, so you need a very strong third sector. And I think the real work that we have to put in is strengthening that That's third sector. That civil society. And I, does that come back to, to this complicated notion of this dance between what is particular and what is universal? I mean, yeah. you know, you, um, you said that the Bible argues that universalism is the first step, not the last step yeah. in the growth of moral imagination. Sure, we did. talked about this a minute ago, but, 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 but that, uh, draw that idea out for me. Look, you have, the, you have, for instance, the state. We are going to be pretty universal here because it's not going to help you very much if everyone is a moral relativist in terms of what side he's going to drive his car. You know, I mean, right, are, you, okay. are you with me? We need a set of rules mm -hmm. that everyone is going to follow if we are to have a law-governed society. The, the state is pretty universal. The market, you know, is pretty universal. I, I cannot charge you a high price for a good because I think you can afford it. And, you know, I mean, you know, there are mechanisms there that make the relationship between buyer and seller not a particular one. Um, that's called insider dealing, if we try and do that. So the state and the market are areas when, where we kind of enter as universal human beings. Mm -hmm. But it's the civil sector where I um, go to the local synagogue, but my neighbors are Christian and the people over the road are Sikh. And, you know, they're ha and they're, the Hindus are celebrating Diwali and we go in and we enjoy it with them and we're celebrating tabernacles and we invite them to come into our little booth, our little hut for our little sukkah for, for tabernacles. And that is the area of plurality where we have many systems of meaning. And uh, that is where I think we learn to get on with one another. But I think you're also saying... And this is a bit counterintuitive, let's say, in American culture mm -hmm. in the last century, that the most vibrant contribution mm. to that plurality, to civil society, mm. to, in fact, is having a vital, strong, particular identity. Yeah. That that, that, that in fact, uh, of course, it depends on how it's expressed, but that that, in fact, is the best hope for... Um, I, 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 for the sake of universal, what yeah. is universal? Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I can't say honestly at my extreme age that I am seriously into rap music. But there's a Jewish Hasidic rap singer called Matiz Yahu. Uh, you've come across him? I he's have a, not. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very orthodox <laughs> Jew with a big hat and his fringes hanging out, and he's got millions of young fans, most of whom aren't Jewish. Now, you can't get more particularistically Jewish than Matis Yahu. Mm -hmm. He's so Jewish. And everyone can relate to them, him, Jewish or non-Jewish, because, you know, 
you know what? That's, that's a distinctive voice. Um, and I think that's, for instance, why people relate to the Dalai Lama, because he's different from us. You know, when, I really, when you really reach the very depth of particularity, when an Indian novelist is writing from the, you know, that is where all of us can relate to, them, to him or her. And it's that's not, the big paradox. And it's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift, you know. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why it is. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, and Isaiah comes along and he delivers his prophecies. And they're so particular to that faith, that place, that time. Mm-hmm. And yet I call Isaiah the poet laureate of hope. And you, you know, <laughs> at the height of, uh, of, of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, at the very height of it, There he is, quoting verbatim two lines from Isaiah chapter 40, the King James translation. I can't remember it. I don't know it so well in English. But, you know, I have a dream that one day every valley will be right and every mountain laid out and all flesh will see it together. You know, I doubt whether Isaiah, 27 centuries ago in the Middle East, could envisage that one day, you know, black civil rights activists would be moved by his words. But it's the particularity of Isaiah that spoke to a Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. It is, that's how we are as a people, you know? I don't know why it is, how it is, but it's the authentic, the unique, the different that makes us feel enriched when we encounter it. And it's this bland, plastic, synthetic, universal, can't tell one brand of coffee from another brand of coffee that makes life flat, uninteresting, and essentially uncreative. So I wonder, is this one reason um, that so much of religious revival tends to happen at the conservative end of the spectrum, at the orthodox end of the spectrum? Yeah. Because that's that's where where these particularities are cultivated? That is where the flame burns at its most intense. So talk to me about, as an Orthodox Jew, as chief rabbi, um, you know, t- talk to me about some particularities, some specific virtues, teachings. I mean, you've been getting at some of this yeah. that you that you honor and that are at the heart of your faith that uh, that you think are particularly important and relevant to offering up to our common life in the twenty first century. Look, the two very famous Jewish festivals, Passover and Tabernacles. It seems to me, you know, people can really relate to those. Passover, where we meet as families. This is a a very important service that takes place not in the synagogue, but at home. And we tell the story of how our ancestors were slaves. But we don't just tell the story, we reenact it. We eat the bread of affliction, we taste the bitter herbs of slavery, we drink four cups of the wine of freedom, and we hand that story on to our children, and the story begins with questions asked by the youngest child around the table. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I would have thought that story, well, I know that story speaks to Christians when they attend uh, or they conduct a Seder service. That is universal. That is, speaks to anyone who knows what it is to be a slave uh, or who needs to know what it feels like to be a slave so that they can be active in fighting the cause of Mm -hmm. people who are oppressed. And that is another example of a story that, in fact, has been. Yeah. uh, It's had a particular impact on American history. Mm But it also inspired liberation theologians in uh, South America. And to some extent, Nelson Mandela is echoing the phrase when he calls his autobiography the long walk to freedom. I mean, you know, that's... Mm-hmm. Um, and Tabernacles, to me, is, is such a festival for the 21st century. Okay, and that won't be as familiar to many people, so say So somewhere. that is when we recall the 40-year journey through the wilderness. When the Israelites had no homes, they were just essentially like Bedouin. They were living in tents or shacks. So for seven days, we leave the comfort of home. We build a shack with only leaves for a roof. 
And so we're exposed to this heat by day and the cold by night. And we just understand for seven days what it is to be homeless. Now, how many of us, you know, in, in the West know what it feels like to be homeless? But we need to feel like what it's like to be homeless because there are a billion people on the face of this planet who are pretty near as it gets to being homeless. So um, I think those speak with enormous power. And you see why. Because they're not abstract ideas that you can deliver in a lecture and expect everyone to understand. They are as concrete and specific as you get. And I think every religion has specifics like that, rituals, narratives. Um, one, one interfaith occasion we did years and years and years ago uh, with African bishops. It was ra Orthodox rabbis and African bishops. And we did a lot of interfaith theology, and we talked about all the stuff we had in common. And it was wonderful and very boring. And I was thinking, you know, <laughs> let's, 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 you know, let's break through. So in the end, uh, at the last, last night, I said, let's just sit around a table and have some food and drink. And we are going to teach you our songs mm. and our stories. And you are going to teach us your songs and your stories. And we went on till three or four in the morning, and I think we could have made world peace then and there. <laughs> you didn't tape that, did you? I wish I had. No, I did too. Many years ago. <laughs> because <laughs> we would put it on the radio. Yeah. I remember having a conversation with um, a scholar who's actually Jewish. She's the head of uh, the Annenberg Chair for Religion at the Knight School uh -huh. of Journalism at the University of Southern California, and we talked about television. Yeah. Talked about how there's kind of a renaissance of intelligent television in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how this is fulfilling this basic human need we have for stories. Yeah. And that in fact a lot of good storytelling is again happening, well, I don't know if it ever has before, is happening on television. But she also talked about the Passover story mm. as an example of this incredibly low-tech story. Mm. But that its power uh, that the proof is in the fact that it is, has survived and flourished. And, and it is also a wonderful example of the power of a story. And it receives, a different, it receives a different meaning in mm -hmm. every generation. Mm -hmm. And so do thick rituals. For instance, you know, uh, in the days of Moses, the Sabbath was a way of giving liberty to slaves. Mm. But now think of what you and I are slaves to. Liberty from iPhones. iPhones, <laughs> exactly. or right. Blackberries. I don't wish to be critical to any particular manufacturer. Email. So, and for 25 hours, you cannot get an email. Mm -hmm. Is that not liberty? Mm -hmm. so, it's um, humanizing. It's, you know, it's, it's just giving you space for the things that are important but not urgent. So any real religious ritual that is not just an abstract idea will receive new meanings uh, with every passing age. You've made a statement that I love. Uh, I think it's audacious. Uh, the greatest single antidote to violence is conversation. Speaking our fears, listening to the fears of others, and in that sharing vulnerabilities, in, in that sharing of vulnerabilities, discovering a genesis of hope. Now, as someone who conducts conversation for a living, I love that statement. I wonder how you know that to be true, that the antidote to violence is conversation. Well, look, we, we've had, uh, we have in, in Judaism this, you know, your listeners may, may find this hard to understand. Uh, especially in a religion where I'm promoting marriage and the family, we have a problem uh, in Jewish religious divorce. For reasons we no needn't go into, a husband can withhold a divorce from a wife so that they may be civilly divorced and living apart, but the wife is unable to, uh, to remarry, mm -hmm. and she's really a living widow. We call her a chained woman, and I have to resolve those things. And in the end, the way we resolve them, 
the really hard cases is actually just by listening. Mm. And that listening gives each of the two parties the feeling that they are heard. And once they're heard, they can then begin to speak what they really feel. And then they can begin to realize that there are things they still care about in common. Not perhaps enough to save their marriage, but certainly enough to remove the animosity from their divorce. And it's extraordinary how a simple act of sitting around a table and speaking and listening can actually solve cases that prove insoluble both by the civil and the religious courts. Likewise, in real conflict sense, you know, I've sat and spoke, talked to, you know, people who used to be Hamas terrorists. Really? And have become peace activists just because they saw, you know, how, um, how, how much of a dead end they were, were getting themselves into. And I just see so much effort at peacemaking taking place at the very elite levels uh, where, you know, egos can be rather larger than they need be and nobody really is well willing to lose for the sake of long-term winning for both of us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think, what would happen if we generated real conversations at the grassroots level between the people whose lives are really affected. One of the most powerful groups for peace in the Middle East is a group of Israeli parents and Palestinian parents right. who've lost children. Yeah, we've had a show about them, yeah. the bereaved families. The bereaved families. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that's that level of civil society yeah. where there's a different conversation taking yeah. place that is transformative. It doesn't yet transform that elite level, but do you see that as a possibility? Of I mean, course. in Israel or, or in elsewhere. theory, it's it's known generically as track two diplomacy. You mm -hmm. you get various tracks taking place that feed into the political process. What has made them impotent up to and including now is that they don't mesh with the system. They aren't track two diplomacy, so. They are great and they get nowhere because the politicians don't listen. They don't have to listen. We have not yet found a way of meshing the political society with the civil society. Mm -hmm. And that's a big challenge. It's doable, um, but you are bringing two very different cultures together. One that is used to solving problems through power and one that uh, knows that power is the worst possible thing you can bring to bear. So how you bring those two cultures together, I don't know, but you will have to in the long run if you want to make peace. Right, it's not going to remain optional. I mean, there are all kinds of examples we can yeah. think of. It's true in American political life. I just, this brought to mind um, a really striking exchange I uh, was present at. at the, Bill Clinton, President Clinton, has something called the Clinton Global Initiative. And mm -hmm. he had convened a a gathering there. Shimon Peres was present. Mm -hmm. Ehud Barak was present, I believe. Mm -hmm. He wasn't on the panel. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, uh, Abbas's Prime Minister, the, mm -hmm. and um, the Crown Prince of Bahrain. But mm -hmm. Shimon Peres said something. I, he's in his 80s now. That mm -hmm. was so striking to me. The premise of this conversation was a peace agreement has been reached. What happens the day after? Mm -hmm. So we were talking about the, they were talking about the mm -hmm. day after. But Shimon Peres, who apparently spends a lot of time with his grandchildren, mm -hmm. asking them to tell him how they see the world, mm -hmm. said, if we can reach this agreement, the young people are already connected. Mm. The younger they are, the more connected they are. Mm. I mean, that is also, ultimately, I mean, it's all, it, it has, it, the tool for that is technology, but it is about conversation, right? It is about. It is about conversation, and I think he was absolutely <coughs> right. Um, the real conflicts arise when our minds are focused on the past. We bring to bear a sense of grievance, injustice, victimhood, and we are then held captive by the past. 
if we could get Israelis and Palestinians to think simply of what would be best for their grandchildren, we would move into a new frame of thinking. And yet I think what's so powerful about the Bereaved Families Forum yeah. is that you don't get mm. to that vision for the future without, um, without putting those, not just those grievances, but that grief on the table. That is, and it, it is that power table. of listening and of speaking one's truth yeah. and of one's experience being known. That grief has to be heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has to be heard by the other side. One of the most powerful rituals, it's astonishingly powerful, is in the Passover service when we read the ten plagues. And it's our custom. The ten plagues. The ten plagues that hit Egypt. Right, and, and we recite them. That's you know, a hard story the, the for modern blood, people. frogs, etc. Mm -hmm. And with each one we shed, we spill a drop of wine. We shed a tear. Right. We shed a tear because for a moment we allow ourselves to think of the victims of our victories, the pain of the other side, who were enslaving us, but they were still human and they were still suffering. It's when you can feel your opponent's pain that you are beginning the path that leads to reconciliation. Are we okay? Just oh, okay. Just we just have a couple more minutes. We will finish it for. Technology. Ready? No? Mm. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've never seen a camera without a cameraman before. It's very interesting. Without what? Without somebody behind it before. Oh. The BBC doesn't do things this way. I don't. It's a very clever way. I don't know anything about it. I'm clueless, mm. low tech. We did a program about Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel with, mm. uh, with Arnold Eisen, who's mm. the chancellor mm. of Jewish Theological mm. Seminary. And it was really wonderful to get mm. into that. Mm. I don't think Heschel is as well known as he should be. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, I think that this institution, this office that you hold, the chief rabbi, mm. is probably a, a, a probably new idea to many Americans, mm. and mm. it's an unusual institution was started, mm. as I understand, in the 19th century Victorian Britain. Mm. I just want to ask you, uh, you know, tell me what have been some of the formative, uh, perhaps surprising, defining experiences you've had in these 19 years in this completely unique office. We've seen a real transformation of the British Jewish community. We now have something like three times as many Jewish children mm. going to Jewish schools as they did before I became chief rabbi. That's an enormous transformation in, in a one lifetime. Uh, we've seen a cultural renaissance. Uh, it used to be a little bit staid. Now it's one of the most creative communities. And, and that really, I think, thrilled me because I, I did realize that one of the best forms of leadership is to make space for people to be creative, to give them safe space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's led to a real renewal of Jewish life. And how, how has this experience and how have other experiences in this office, how have they changed you and your theology? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually made me 
relax. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I suddenly realized uh, that there are, in real public office, moments of stress that are so great that they kind of strip away all the surfaces and you get to bedrock of character. And then you suddenly realize that it's not about you and it's not about popularity, it's about them and it's about God and it's about, you know. Your job is just to make it safe for the people, mm. to experiment, to love, to forgive, to pray, to give. Um, and I, I think that's something you have to be go through a lot of battering to achieve. You know, no pain, no gain, I think, is a Jewish sentiment just as it is a Christian one. Um, and I think you go through those years of challenge and trial, and then you realize that, you know, the highest form of leadership is empowering others to lead. Mm -hmm. There's a, a line of yours... I don't know if it's true to say that it's a famous line, but it feels kind of famous to me. And it, it might also please you, I think, but I mm -hmm. first heard it in the, quoted by a young Muslim interfaith mm -hmm. leader, um, that um, when you compared the beginning of the 21st century in terms of religious dynamics to Europe mm. at the beginning of the 17th century, mm. and this was in the Dignity of Difference, and you said, but religion is not what the Enlightenment thought it would become, mute, marginal, and mild. It is fire and like fire, it warms, but it also burns. And we are the guardians of the flame. Mm. I think you've just described to me part of your function as a guardian of the flame. Mm. Then I wonder also, um, in, in closing, if you would talk to me about how, what you see when you look at the world in terms of seeds of a deeper moral and spiritual imagination emanating from your tradition and other traditions. Um, wh where are you finding hope? <clears throat> I think God is setting us a big challenge, a really big challenge. Our, our, we are living so close to difference with such powers of destruction that he's really giving us very little choice. You know, to quote that great line from W.A. Jordan, we must love one another or die. Mm. And that is, I think, where we're at at the beginning of the 21st century. And since we really can love one another, I have a great deal of hope. Um, you know, here it is, a glorious world where we have mastered all the mysteries, or as many as, more than we ever thought we would of nature, but we have not yet conquered the mystery within ourselves. And that is the challenge God is setting us. And I believe that you can begin to see religious leaders coming together in a way they never did before, with an openness to one another they never had before. And somehow or other, the bigger the challenge, the greater we grow. So I am full of hope as we face the greatest challenge humanity ever has. Well, Rabbi Sachs, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, great. Thank you for a good conversation. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Yes, before you head out. <laughs> it's such a quiet room that uh, yeah. the paper pops up. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> on this interview, as we move forward, um, is there a contact in your office that should be reaching out to you? Uh, we do that day a month. Right. <laughs> <laughs> April. April Bobo here at Emory has helped to coordinate this interview. Yeah. But beyond that, Today, when you return to the UK, is there, do you have an assistant? We want to let you know yeah. when this will be on the air and, and follow the question. If 
you send it to April 8th, we'll follow up. Yeah. Okay. okay. With, who is that? Chief Rabbi's office? John. Who is it, John? John. John. Okay. Yeah, because we have a little bit of shelf like that. Oh, she's going to show up this time. I think, yeah. Well, that was fabulous. Thank you. So, what a great interview. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Well, I told you, I've been, I've been heading towards you for years. And I'll, <laughs> I'll see you on the stage with His yeah. Holiness. I'm oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So, thanks very much. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish someone that really doesn't want to Yeah. A good, a good Sabbath. A good Sabbath. That does. I appreciated your uh, Sukha story. My, I've been building with my sons. I go to a Jewish community center. All right. Here, and we've been building little sticks. Uh, Trent actually would absolutely qualify to be a rabbi. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No. <laughs> they serve all. I've got to tell you, they make more sense in Atlanta than they do in London. Thank you so much. And you know, however good anyone, a good British accent just makes it. <laughs>